the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Good morning. So today we're celebrating in a festal tune, uh, the Feast of Circumcision of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, which, so it's one of the minor feasts of our Lord. And uh, the Gospel today... The Gospel today covered two events, two feasts. When you really pay attention to them, it's two, two events and two are, both of them are, major, are, are minor feasts in our church. There are seven minor feasts and seven major feasts and the Gospel today covered two of them. The first one is the Feast of Circumcision and that happened on the eighth day. And also after that also, you're, you're the, 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 the the, the other part of the gospel covers when St. Mary and St. Joseph brought, brought Jesus to the temple, which is another minor feast, and that is actually in the 40th day after his birth. So eight days was circumcision, and then 40th days when her time of purification was over, uh, they basically brought uh, an offering and they brought him to the church as well. And this is when we read about the two prophet prophet. Uh, the prophet Anas and, and Anna, when they, Simeon and Anna, when they uh, saw Christ uh, of that. So this is two. We're going to talk about the first which we commemorate today is the Feast of Circumcision. And that's what we want to focus on. So wanted to talk a little bit about circumcision and that feast itself. And, and to have a deeper meaning. And by the way, and I hope that next year when, we, when this feast, we want to go into it a little bit deeper. Uh, circumcision, it's an act, and, and we read about it, and it wasn't new when, the, when Christ had it. It was actually many years before, and it was because of a covenant that God had with Abraham. And we'll read it really fast. Uh, we're going to just go through it really fast, because it, it's important. I want you to kind of read more to it in the Bible, because to, to understand, it's not that hard. In Genesis, 7, in Genesis uh, 15, it talks about this. In verse 17, it says this. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, Abram, by the way, Abram, and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I'll make my covenant between me and you, and won't multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall you be named Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. So one thing that you read in Genesis 15, Abraham believed. And once Abraham believed, there was something that has to show that belief. So there is a renaming. Renaming such of it was Amos Abram now became Abraham and the same thing when you read a little further Sarai his wife she was also renamed it was her name was Sarai and now became Sarah and then in verse 9 he goes on and it says and God said to Abram as for you you shall keep my covenant you and your descendant after you throughout their, their generations this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you every male among you shall be circumcised and you 99 years old shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you so there's an outer sign of the covenant between God and Abram Abraham at that point he was he was is he was is, is the eighth day he who is eighth eight day old among you shall be circumcised every male shall in your generation he who is born in your house or brought with money from your foreigner who is not your descendant he who is born on your house and he who is brought with money must be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh of an everlasting covenant and look at verse 14 because it's very interesting and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be put from his people. <clears throat> he has broken my covenant. This is in the Old Testament. Circumcision in the New Testament is not necessary. Circumcision in the New Testament, so what was the sign of circumcision? Basically, it was being, it's an outer mark in the male only to be separated for God. He's not like everyone else. He's separated. He stands out. He's not, he will not do like all the other people do. So in the New Testament, that act of circumcision, which Christ did, by the way, and, and, and He took that upon Himself to prove that He was full human. 
But in the New Testament, in Colossians 2.11, St. Paul teaches us, in whom you were also circumcised, in him is capital H, meaning it's Christ, in him you were also circumcised with circumcision made without hands. By putting off, so this is the New Testament uh, act of circumcision, putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And what is the circumcision of Christ? Verse 12 clearly says it. Buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So what is the act of circumcision in the New Testament? Is when we die with Christ and we rise again. And just like circumcision set the Israelite aside, the, the, the descendants of Abraham aside from everyone, baptism is to do the same to us. We are to, set, to be set aside. And, and, and we need to in, understand that it's a covenant that we had with God and we need to live that covenant and we need to always be remembered of that covenant. One of the, the big issues as Christians we face is that when we're set aside, all of so a sudden we are challenged with the temptation of wanting to fit in. Well, the world is doing this, I want to fit in. This person, my, the cool kids in school are doing this, or the in crowd are doing this. And there is this big drive or temptation for us to want to go with the cool kids. Or to want to do what the in crowd do. And the reality is, is we are not like everyone else. And it's important that we remember that. We are set aside for him. We died with him. We rise with him. Ultimately, I made a covenant with the Lord that I actually put on Christ. When I am baptized, I am put on Christ. And therefore, I'm not like everyone else. So we really want to talk today a little bit about this, 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 this drive or the wanting to fit in, wanting to be like the cool kids, wanting to be with the in crowd. And this is something that every one of us face every day. Uh, and it changes throughout your, 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 your life as a young child is, is different than when you're, or when you're older. But every day you really have to make a decision in this world, who are you going to stand with? Are you going to stand with Christ who you died with and rose and, and, and will make you stand out? Or you are going to be follower of the world and, and just wanting to fit in? And it changes. You go, sometimes we, we are driven to go along with the stream. We want, to do, we want to compromise and do everything. As young children, sometimes it could be as simple as going out. Well, my friends are going out to egg some cars. We're going to throw eggs in the cars. Or we're going to go and wrap trees with toilet paper. As a child, I remember that. There, were, there was a drive. There, there, and you want to be cool. You, everyone is doing it. Or maybe in some kids, you want to be cool. You can, you, you, everyone is going, doing shoplifting. Or, 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 and it's important that we think of it and we need to understand and we need to remember today is the Feast of Circumcision which sets us aside or the baptism now sets us aside and we need to remember that. That drive, by the, way, or by the way, or the luring, or to fit in with that cool crowd, we refer to it as peer pressure today. That's what it is. It's peer pressure. And peer pressure is not only among youth, it's among adults, and it goes through on. And it changes as we grow. To some people, that, 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 that drive, or to lure, or, or to be like the cool kids, well, it could be in a form of doing drugs or opioid. Or maybe, in some people, smoking hookah. And I want to fit in. And then you need to remember, I can't fit in because I'm not like the world. I am set aside. It could be swearing, and it could be uh, premarital sex, or, or, and by the way, today, you know, sexual immorality, which the Bible talks about. Today, in the news, you hear about it, sexual misconduct. But it's really sexual immorality. When basically, what is sexual immorality? Is any sexual gratification outside of my spouse any outside of my spouse is considered sexual immorality. And, 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 and you need to remember that sometimes the world will bring that act to something as just a, a feel-good act, but sex is holy. And it's created and God-given between a husband and wife. We need to remember that. There is a lure in schools or whatever. Oh, well, it's good. It's, everybody's doing it. But we need to remember that we're not like everyone else. We are set aside. 
So every time we are lured to fit in, to do what the cool kids or whatever, you know, the sins that the other people do, this is actually a test for each one of us. Are you going to stand with God and with the God that you made a covenant with when you were baptized, or are you going to compromise of the world? So every time and every time when you choose not to swear, when everyone else is swearing, you are making a decision that I am standing with Christ, not standing with everyone else. If you make the decision every day that I'm not going to smoke weed when everyone is smoking weed, I'm gonna, that's, a, that's basically reminding me I am standing with the Lord and, make, and making that, you know, that covenant that I had with Him. So question for us is that you need to remember that you're not the same. You're not like everyone else in the world. And a lot of times when we stand for what we believe in, you will be perceived different. Expect that. You will be perceived strange. Expect that. You will be perceived as an outsider. Expect that. You will be perceived as somebody that is different. And ultimately they will persecute you. But the fact is they persecute our Savior. And we need to remember that in our everyday life. And we need to remember that that's going to happen. But the one thing that I need to remember is that I have a very good future. And that future is reserved for me and no one can take it away from me. I'm not going to give you, I'm going to paint this scenario for you. Say a student that is a very hard working student. He works hard in his school, he focuses on his studies. But then there is this cool crowd that tend to go out partying every Saturday night. Uh, you know, and, and he feels like I'm being deprived. I'm not partying with them. I'm, I'm not drinking with them. I'm not doing weed with them. I'm not doing, I'm not doing all these things. And sometimes the temptation is I feel deprived. But then that student works hard in his school and he ultimately graduates and has the degree in his hand while maybe some of the cool kids did not work as hard because of what they're doing. And at the end, they, you graduate, the, the good person that, that studies hard graduates, while the cool kid was because of not focusing on the study, may not graduate high school. Who do you feel sorry for at that time? Who is truly deprived at that time? Is it the one that has the degree and, and fulfilled the goal or the one that didn't make it? And the thing is, for us as Christians in the midst of the world, there is, there is going to be a lure to want us to fit in and to do the things of the world, to do the things that the crowd do. The important thing that we need to remember, we have a future that is set aside for us and we need to remember that. And First Peter talks to us very clearly about that. When you read First Peter verse 1, he's writing to a group of people and he's referring to them, to the pilgrims. Do you know what the word pilgrims is? Pilgrim is like somebody that is an alien, somebody that is a stranger. Like for instance, when somebody goes to a pilgrim, a pilgrimage, he goes there temporary and he comes back. Pilgrim is also, the way that I like to envision it, is a visitor or a tourist. And when you go to Santa Monica Pier and you walk around, you will really find out who's tourist. And even when we go somewhere in the world, you'll find who is the tourist. The tourists are going to be standing out different. They will tend to take pictures. They have their camera and, and they're different. And the thing is, when St. Peter writes this epistle, which is a universal epistle, which means it's to us, he calls us pilgrims. That we are not of this world. We will stand out. Like when a visitor stands out, that you're not going to be, and you are going to, we are strangers to this world, and we're going to be here for, for a short period of time, and we will go back. If in First Peter, who he calls them pilgrim, and, and this, you know, the people, he, he, he points out five uh, Roman cities at that time, that was, that's today Turkey, by the way, and he writes this to them. He tells them in 1 Peter 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us. How we were begotten? We're begotten by the baptism. In the, we're, we're born again in baptism. And how are we begotten? We're in the baptism. And that give us living hope. 
And that is something important that we, are, we as Christians are always to have, is we always to have hope. When you analyze some of the things of the world, what people proclaim that it's cool or in, a lot of times that, the, that group of people, a lot of it is empty. They're empty inside, no matter how coolness, no matter how much drugs, no matter how much weed, no matter how much sin, there is still emptiness in them, and there is loneliness, and there is always a, a level of anxiety in them. But we as Christians, yes, we may struggle in this world, but we have a good future, and our hope is in that future. And this is what Saint Peter, Saint Paul is talking. I'm sorry, Saint Peter is talking about that we have a living hope. And several months ago, we talked about hope. And that hope comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead when Christ rose and He raised us with Him. And then in verse 4 it says, this is our hope. This is when you're looking for that diploma or, or that degree or that trophy. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away. And this is, yes, we will struggle in this world, but we have an inheritance waiting for us. An inheritance that no one can take. In other words, I'll give you an example. If a parent leaves an inheritance in the form of stocks to his children, these stocks may go up, may go down, and sometimes may not value a whole lot. But then the inheritance that we have, it doesn't go up, it doesn't go down. It's stable and it's incorruptible. It will not decay. It's undefiled. It will not fade away. And then it's reserved. That word is huge. You know what the word reserved means? When you go to a hotel and you have a reservation, say the person right in front of you may not have a reservation. And they're arguing with him, well, there's no space for you, but you have a reservation, you're comfortable. Yes, this guy is, might be struggling, he might have, but I have a reservation. And this is one of the hope we have is that we, uh, we to us, it's an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for me and you as believers, as those who were born again in that baptism. It's kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be ready in that last time. This is, this is what, we, that what keeps us going. And then he goes on and he tells you, you know, children, don't worry. In those in this you will greatly rejoice. Be, be happy in this when you're, when you're, when you're in the trials. Through, though now for a little while, whatever we're living with, going through, or the luring and the temptation to fit in with the, good ki with, the, with the cool kids, it's a little while. If need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Yes, you may feel deprived. Yes, you may feel like, but I'm going to tell you that when you look at the big picture, you're really not being deprived. There is the regeneration, and it says here that when you go through these trials, it shows, in verse 7, the genuineness of your faith. So it shows how genuine your faith is when you're going. Am I going to stand with God, or I'm going to stand with the cool kids? I'm going to go with the world. And when, when you focus on, your, on your, that, that covenant that you made, you are actually, you are to rejoice because you have, you're, you, it's showing your faith. More precious than gold that perishes. So your faith is actually more precious than gold. And I want to talk a little bit about gold purification. Do you know how they purify gold? When you look at how they purify gold, they put gold under very intense heat. And the harder, the higher the heat is, all of a sudden the imperfection goes to the top. And the person, the jeweler, will wipe off the imperfection. And then put on more heat and wipes off the... And all of a sudden... When the jeweler sees his glare, sees his face in the gold, that's when he realizes that gold is clean right now. There is no more imperfections that keep coming out. And this is what happens to us. We will be grieved. We will be trialed. And you want to look at it as these trials, the Lord is perfecting us and brushing off imperfection. And you'll probably think, Abuna, it is very hard. It's, it's really demoralizing. I can't keep this. I, I'm very lured to doing these other things. But the thing is, how, and you question, how long will this go on? And the answer will be, just like the jeweler, when he sees his glare in the gold, that's how long it's going to be. And we're going to live our life little by little, clearing some imperfection. And ultimately, we are perfected like him. And that's what the verse says. Being much more precious than gold that perishes, 
though it's tested by fire, may be found praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we are to live our life. We are to stand with that covenant and never feel deprived, be, deprived because you remember there is fullness in your heart. There is going to be a good inheritance waiting for you. And I pray that that is something that is very clear. That, that we seek at the end, that we receive at the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. May the blessings of this feast always remind us that we are different from the world and we are to live according to the covenant and the commandments that we made with the Lord, that the covenant that we made in the Lord in baptism and all the glory be to our God forever. Amen.